Deuteronomy 30, 11. This is the commandment that I command you today. For this is the commandment that I command you today. It is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I've set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him, for he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. Let me tell you a couple of things right off the bat that I hope you know that I know. I know we're not Old Testament Israel. I know that we're not saved by keeping the uh, Hebrew law. I understand that if we've offended in one point of the law, then we're guilty of the whole thing. And the only thing that brings us into a right relationship with God the Father is the blood of Jesus Christ, who is God the Son. That is the only way we are ever made right with God. And so you will not hear me tonight tell you to obey in order to be saved. We obey from our salvation, not for our salvation. There's been only one who's been perfectly obedient to the Father, and that is his only begotten Son, the only spotless substitutionary Lamb who died on the cross in order to pay the price for your sin and my sin. And those that have believed upon him, who have surrendered to him, who have said, be the Lord of my life, I recognize you as that, I repent of my sin, and I enter into covenant by faith that your death has covered my sin, and your life guarantees my eternal life. Jesus is Lord. When you come into those kind of moments, you are saved by grace through faith. So before you start protesting your heart as I go through this, I'm not talking about how you can be saved. Tonight I want to talk to you about how you can be blessed. And if we can use the word that is kind of a snarky term, how you can be successful. I mean, all you got to do is scour social media or your local bookstore, and there is no shortage of writings and communications telling you how to be successful. The problem is, is every author has a different definition of what true success is, and most Western authors are going to equate success with what we call the American dream. The American dream is work hard for as short a time as you can, gain enough material wealth as much as you can, retire as early as you can, and live the rest of your days in luxury and ease, and they will tell you that that is a successful life. And I'm going to tell you that has nothing to do with success in the kingdom, nothing. And yet we are inundated from every resource in our culture telling us that if we don't have those things, then the level of our success goes down in measurement for each one of those things we happen not to be possessing. And so therefore, people that don't have any money, they don't deem themselves successful. Or people that have tons of money, who may not have any kind of spiritual life in them, they will say, I am successful. The problem is this, everybody's drawing a premature finish line. In other words, the measurement of success by worldly standards means what happens while you're alive. The measure of success by kingdom standards is not only what happens with your life while you're alive, but what happens afterwards. And so when, when as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, as, as, as a brother, as a leader, my heart is this, 
I want to make sure that I'm communicating in a way that prepares you for the ultimate evaluation of whether or not you were successful, and that is the Bema seat of Jesus Christ, where we will stand before him and we will give an answer for what we did with our lives. And the good from our lives will be rewarded by him. And the things that were wor not worth anything will be burned away. And in the end, all our success is, me is measured by what was done for Jesus and done in love for him. That is success. How can we ever accomplish something like that? Would you be surprised if I told you it's not as complicated as you've been led to believe? I'm going to give you these basic things that every single Christian in this room can absolutely do and begin to grow in. And at the end of your days, you will stand before the Lord and you will hear the words that every child of God longs to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let's get back into the text. Let me give you what I call the simplicity of success. The simplicity of success and first of all Moses is telling the people of Israel that success has already been revealed he says in verse 11 the commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you neither is it far off now I love that because Moses is old Moses has been shepherding these people for 40 years Moses knows the ins and outs of how people think and how they respond to the claims of God on their life and he knows that some people are going to to, to as he's rehearsing in the uh, uh, former chapters all that God has given all that God has said all that God has required it's the law of God Deuteronomy is, is from the word deutero it means twice and, and nomos, which is law, the twice given, it's the second giving of the law. And so they're hearing all of this for chapter after chapter, and Moses is coming in the end of it, and he says, everything I've said to you today is not too hard for you. I don't know how you've been inclined to believe. Maybe you see God as a, just an impossible to please, kind of frowning, scowling deity in the sky. Maybe he, you filtered him through the image of authority figures in your life that were less than loving or not very affirming or, or, or not even the ones that are male. Maybe it was a, a mom or an aunt or a grandma that you could never please no matter what you did. And we tend to translate and project those kind of things on the Lord. But one of the things I think the Father wants us to know is that he's actually happier than far more, far, uh, uh, more evangelicals are happy. God is happier than most Christians. And, and, and I don't know how we got the idea of God being up there, impossible to please, just looking for us to step one hair out of line so he can relieve his desire to pound us. Now, maybe that's a little extreme. Maybe you don't think like that. But I, I have met people that live in constant fear and perfectionism because if there's a slip up, they feel like they fouled up the relationship with God. That's not him. You know, pleasing God does not require perfect execution in every area of life under his standards. Most of what I'm going to talk to you about in the remaining time is that success, a life that brings glory to God and brings pleasure to us, John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And that is not cha-ching. That is not necessarily money and material possessions. It may involve that, but ultimately Jesus wants your life to be enjoyed he actually wants you to have pleasure as a Christian and that pleasure being tethered to him. And in order to do that, it's not that hard. Moses says, uh, you can do this. It's not that far off. We'll look down in verses 12 and 14. He goes to a little more depth and he says, success, the successful life in the kingdom is attainable. He says, it's not in heaven that you should say who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it back to us that we may hear it and do it. Moses says, it's, it's, it's not beyond the sea that you should say, who'll go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But I like this. He says, but the word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart so that you can do it. There, there's this mindset in a lot of us that there's a, a special layer of Christianity that only the select few can tap into. And it's, it's kind of revealed that same kind of thought here where Moses says, yeah, you don't have to travel overseas to get the special sauce. You don't have to climb a ladder to heaven to have some ecstatic experience with the Lord and, and, and get a special revelation. 
Uh, how many of us have been in seasons where we thought the greatest thing that we needed was some special revelation? We need a word. We need something, Lord. Rick Pino posted this week. He's like, some of y'all are wanting a new word for 2019. You hadn't done anything with the one he gave you for 2018. And, and you know, we're, we're prone to do that. Give me something new. We're like those people on Mars Hill that are always wanting to learn something new. But the reality is, is if we will master what we've already received, if we, will, um, if we will take what we've already been, uh, had revealed to us, we'll take it to the, to the furthest extent that God will enable us to do so, we're going to experience some things. I'm going to tell you, most of us in the room, we could make it the rest of our days without a fresh word of revelation. And if we would only take all that energy in seeking something new and turn it into doing our best with what we already know, Moses says it's already in your mouth. Moses says it's already in your heart. You don't have to go and find it out there. You already know it. But you know what? That's not as exciting. Um, nobody posts, you know, on, on social media uh, uh, about, you know, hey, <laughs> really enjoying my discipline this week. Yeah. I obeyed another discipline. I, nobody's going to go off on that. Why? Because it just doesn't move anybody because we are so addicted to what is supernatural and sensational and neon. It's got to be cool. It's got to be, it's got to be Instagram worthy. It's got to be Snapchat worthy or tweet worthy or whatever for us old people, Facebook worthy. It's, it's just got to be something spectacular. And I want to tell you, man, most of the Christian life is unspectacular. Don't be offended with that. Most of the Christian life is unspectacular. It doesn't mean it's not deeply enriching and satisfying, but most of it is not tongues of flame, a flame of tongues above our head and the wind blowing through the house at optimum speeds for this supernatural encounter. That doesn't happen to me every day. Now, I don't know if it happens to you guys every day, but I'm going to tell you something. Even if it did, we'd still need what Moses is leading us to understand here. I like verse 15 because I'm real big on personal accountability. Verse 15, success has not only been revealed, it's not only attainable, but success is up to you. It is entirely up to you. Now, this is where I'm going to challenge you, especially anybody in the room and anybody listening later that has the I'm a perpetual victim mentality. I'm going to take the stick pen of reality and I'm going to burst the bubble of that lie in your life because it's not true. Moses says, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And so Moses is referring to chapter number 28, 29, and then also probably referring loosely to the things that came before that. Moses has put before them the word of God that God gave to Moses, Moses, Moses inscribes it, and his, his calling as their leader was to give it to them. And Moses says, I've given it to you, and through the rest of the chapter, he's going to be asking this rhetorical question. Now, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? Friends, choices in, in a God direction, pressing into the Lord in obedience and faithfulness in what you already know is the pathway towards the successful life in the kingdom. And I'm going to make big statements here. There is nobody that can get in the way of you in doing God's will. Nobody. Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 3, I have the key of David. I open a door, nobody's going to shut it when I open it. I shut a door, nobody's going to open it when I shut it. What does that tell me? It tells me that the only one that can get in our way and stop us from doing anything would be the Lord himself. But when we come to that place, friends, where all we want to do is bring pleasure to the heart of God, when all we want to do is live our lives, even in the mundane things, for the glory of God, when all we want to do is yield and trust and obey and grow, when we get into that season of life, I'll make a big, bold statement. You are invincible in the will of God until he is done with you. That there is no place in the Christian life for us to be perpetual victims. I don't want you to raise your hand, but if I did, if I said this, raise your hand if you had some really lousy years in your childhood. There would be a lot of hands that would go up in the room. 
Some mamas did us wrong. Some daddies did us wrong. And then as you entered into adulthood, maybe some pastors did you wrong. Maybe some bosses did you wrong. Some siblings did you wrong. Maybe you were betrayed. Maybe you were abandoned. Maybe you were spoken against in prejudice, whether it be racial or generational or, or national prejudice. Maybe people came against you. Maybe you have been oppressed. Maybe you have been rejected. Maybe you have experienced it, the betrayal and all of the things that happen to people in life. Here's the question. Do you you believe that you and God can overcome that or not that is the question and so none of us in the house none of us can ever get to the place in life where we feel justified saying there's a lot of people out there that can enter into God's best but I'm not one of them I'm a perpetual victim friends if you ever want the anointing of God on your life it is up to you and it is up to me to shed the victim mentality to take that smothering tarp off of our spirit and begin to respirate the air of the kingdom instead of the air of lies that the enemy says. One of the greatest uh, themes in all of Scripture is how the Father heart of God delights to take those people that the world has cast off, abused, forgotten, rejected, betrayed, and abandoned for God to reach down into the pit and the miry clay and bring them up and stand that person on the solid rock and put a new song in their mouth, even praise unto their God. And so, if anything, I think those betrayals and abandonments and pains and prejudices and discriminations and all those things that come against us, if anything, I actually believe they better position us. They put us in a better position to receive the blessing that leads to the successful life. Why? Because a broken and contrite heart he will not despise. You see, when, when your heart's broken, when you've been crushed by people, and when you can aim that pain heavenward and not walk around with a fake churchy smile where you tell everybody everything's great, too blessed to be stressed, and all that nonsense, cliche junk that we're so skilled at. But when you can turn that pain in the direction of the Lord and say, Lord, I ache to my soul. You might even hear the Lord whisper, I'm allowing you to enter into the fellowship of the sufferings with my son because suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope that's the apostle paul in romans chapter number five and friends when we latch into hope we literally start operating at a completely different level i, I actually feel it tonight i mean I'm, I'm, i so want to stick to the text but i'm actually feeling tonight that god is trying to reach out and encourage some of you and, and and you know sometimes the lord encourages us with a pat in the head sometimes he just gets nose to nose with us and he says stop thinking the way you're thinking and I believe that in the room tonight there are some folks that are feeling victimized by life and feeling like there's no hope and feeling like because many are against you you feel like nobody's for you and I just want to come against that with the truth that if God be for you who can successfully be against you and so let's go a little bit further up this verse number 16 we'll talk to you about the secret of success in the kingdom First of all, it involves your will. Listen to what Moses is speaking on behalf of the Lord. And listen, these are principles that are still in play in the kingdom. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today. Just pause here for a moment. I've already told you that the theme of this message is for not for you to discover, learn, and perfectly obey the 613 commandments that are, are kind of incorporated in the Mosaic Law. Because if that's the only way to success, we are all up the creek without a paddle. That is not what I'm talking about. But I do want to lift the principle, the general broad principle of a heart that is inclined to long to obey the Lord that when we are saved the Holy Spirit takes up tabernacle in our lives literally in our bodies you are the temple of God we are the temple of God and because he lives within us the inclination of our spirit 
which is attached in the, the control center of our emotions and, and our aspirations and our wills and our, our intellect. All of that is, is sourced in the control center of the human spirit. And when he is in there, when the Holy Spirit is regulating the human spirit, there's going to be a longing to obey. By the way, just to encourage you, that's why you don't enjoy your sin anymore. You know, theoretically, in case anybody sinned last week, we'll just make it theoretical, but that's why you were grieved. That's why you can't enjoy it. That's, that's why you can't continue on in it. That's why you know when you say something, think something, or do something that is outside of the boundaries of the character of God, you're grieved at your core about it. And so what do we do? We long to obey. Now, Raise your hand if you've perfectly executed obedience every day of your life since you accepted Jesus. Good, no liars in the room. We all know that. We all know that we haven't done that. So, so then what's the point of, of hitting this? We're talking about the heart posture. As a matter of fact, how do we get to that place? It, it's, the next, it's the next part. Your will must be to obey God. Hear me on that. God does not bless rebellion. God never endorses our rebellion. There are consequences for our disobedience that's still in play. I know that the cross of Jesus Christ has expunged our guilt, our judicial guilt, but there are consequences for our disobedience that did not get tossed out. And, and, and the, the, the part, of the, part of the motivation in, 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 in obeying is that we have learned at this point what the consequences are to disobedience, and so we learn over time not to be foolish, not to choose disobedience and think we can get off scot-free. But here's the better motivator. It's in the next phrase in verse 16. He says, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving, by loving the Lord your God. Now, isn't this amazing? Because we, we often have this conception of the Old Testament being more about just kind of cut and dry judicial obedience. God's the rule maker and we're the rule obeyers and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of um, motivation in relationship. We don't think that way much about the Old Testament outside of the Psalms. It, it just seems a little bit of thou shalt, thou shalt not if we're not reading it properly. But I love the fact that right here in the midst of a high call for Israel, as they're moving into the place of blessing, as they're moving into the God-ordained, God-promised best place for them and their lives, Moses is saying, you must obey and you will obey because your hearts have been circumcised. That's up there in verses 1 through 10. Your hearts have been circumcised. He's given you a new heart that is breathing in and breathing out the covenant, and you can love the Lord your God. I, I want to make a couple of statements here. I always hesitate to do this because people are, are uh, we just have this appetite to know the scandalous details. And I don't really have a scandalous past since I got saved. Before my salvation, it was pretty jacked up. But when I got saved, uh, my heart's always been to long to obey the Lord. But I can look back after 20-something years of being saved, 25, 25 years of being saved almost, I can look back and I can see seasons where there were areas where I was disobedient. And I can actually look back and say, I see the Lord trying to bring me into obedience. I see me resisting. Then I see me getting a little breakthrough, then going back. And yeah, I know, I'm sure none of y'all have ever had anything like that in your lives, but I'm the one on trial here, so let me just go ahead and confess. that, that There were seasons where I disobeyed, and let me tell you, what brought me ultimately out of those seasons of, of areas of disobedience, it, it was not, I'm going to get in trouble. It, it is not, you know, some fear of losing everything because again, these weren't, you know, I'm not out running around on my wife or cutting people's heads off or cheating on my taxes or anything, but it, it's heart disobedience. It could be something as simple as arrogance and get justifying myself where I think I might be better than somebody or any of those areas. Ultimately, what brought me to repentance was, was God making his affection and love and mercy and grace and compassion known to me to the point where I realized I'm not breaking a rule. I'm violating a relationship. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not breaking a commandment. I'm actually hurting the heart of God because he loves me. And the greatest catalyst for us pressing in into obedience is not trying our best to keep the rules so we can outscore the Christian next to us. That's called legalism. 
the best motivation is saying, my goodness, how much he loves me, how he pursued me, how he went after me, how he stayed by me, how he's been steadfast. How can I not love back the one that has loved me first and loved me most? And it is in those seasons where we grasp the love of the Father that obedience doesn't feel like chains around our soul. It feels like wings to our soul and we begin to soar again. Verse 16, it's also the secret of success does involve your will. You have to choose to obey. It involves your priorities. You got to love the Lord more than you love you. And it also involves your actions. Here's where we're talking about. By walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules. Now, that is overwhelming to me. And literally, the call of Israel was to such a high level of faithfulness that when the law was given, it would be impossible for any Israelite to walk in all of those ways. And yet God sets this holy standard of perfection over them to bring them to that place of broken humility where they know they need a sacrifice for their sins. And all of that system ended up pointing to the final sacrifice who's Jesus our Lord. But what can we learn about this, this secret of success? Listen to me, please. I told you, this wasn't going to be like, whoa, this is more like brass tacks and shoe leather. But it is vital because so many Christians are floundering in their relationship with God. They're like Six Flags Park with ups and downs and roller coasters in the spiritual life, and they can't live a year consistently faithful without going through some implosion, and that's not the will of the Father for us. But it's going to involve your actions and my actions. We actually have to walk out what we say we believe. We have to walk in obedience. We have to walk in faithfulness. We can't be like those whom God indicted through the prophets whose, whose lips drew near to him, but their lives were so far away from him. So it doesn't matter if I can preach the, 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 the lights out. It doesn't matter if, if you or her can sing like with a voice of angels or play with an anointing that nobody knows. Listen, gifting does not prove or, or validate where we are with the Lord. The gifts of God are, are without repentance. The callings of God are without repentance. There's a lot of people who operate in their giftings who are not operating in obedience and intimacy. And so we can't hide behind our giftings. We can't hide behind our knowledge. What does he want us to do? He says, I want you to walk in the ways of me. I want you to walk where I walk. I want you to walk how I walk. I want you to walk for the reasons that I walk. I want you and I to walk together. Walk in my ways with me. And that involves keeping his commandments. I just want to speak to a younger generation and particularly men, but not excluding anybody else in the audience. Gentlemen, it's very common with young men to excel in nine areas in order to compensate for the one hidden area where they continue to go and, and be like the dog returning to its vomit. That is beneath you as a child of God. It is a double sin when we try to compensate for it by excelling in other areas as if to reduce and dilute the, the, the wrongness of these consistent patterns. We, we must love him enough to where we throw ourselves before him. And if there's a stronghold in your life, then you confess there's a stronghold. If there's a besetting sin, then you confess that there's a besetting sin. But the one thing you cannot do is go along compensating for it. That is the devil's tactic to get you to maximize the nine areas in order that you might forget about the one area. What the Lord has called us to is a wholehearted obedience. And he doesn't want you to hide that place from him. By the way, what, what a foolish thing to do to try to hide anything from omniscience. It just doesn't work out well for us. But confessing and forsaking does. And so when we come to this place where we can say, God, be merciful unto me. I'm, I'm operating as a sinner in this area of my life. The Lord starts bringing washing and grace to that. And you'll find yourselves delivered of it. We all know the big ones with, with young men and, and we understand the power of sexual lust and we understand how that grips a generation and now the median age for the first time exposure to pornography is prepubescent now. It's down to like 10 or 11 years old for the first time for our children to be exposed to hardcore pornography. And, and, if, and if grace isn't applied and if, if literally truth isn't brought to bear and if parents don't act in accountability with their children instead of trying to be best buddies with their sons and daughters, but to come in and say, no, I'm an authority in your life. Give me your phone. I want to see what's on it. Now I'm meddling, but I'm meddling with love. When, when you, you've got to come to that place where our kids need to know. 
And if we're not dealing with it when they're 12, you know how hard it's going to be to deal with when they're 16 and how impossible it's going to be? And then we, we go to their wedding and their wife inherits a man that's addicted to pornography and addicted to his lust, all because he was doing great in nine areas and nobody bothered to love him enough to talk about the one area where he's failing and struggling. It's a hard word, but it's a necessary word. Why? Because we play around with sin. We manage our sin and we wonder why we just aren't enjoying this thing called the Christian life. And God's calling us out of it. He's not threatening us. He's not coming as a marauder. He's coming as a father saying, I want to get under that thing with you and bring you out of it. And yet we've become experts at hiding. You know, Adam's fig leaf was not the last time somebody tried to cover up their nakedness before God. And we have so many ways to do it now. And I'm just, I'm just saying this in, in compassion and love um, that God is so intensely merciful and compassionate that if you will come to him honestly, and I promise you there is a very real deliverance from even the strongest temptation in a, a man or a woman's life. But we have to believe. And we do eventually just have to obey. So it also involves your confidence. I'm going to wrap up here shortly. He says this, if you'll obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, if you love the Lord your God, walk in his ways, keep his commandments, then you shall live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. So here's what Moses is doing. He's, he's saying to them, I'm not going to be able to go over to the Canaan land with you, but it's yours. It's your inheritance. It's decreed by God Almighty that this is your destiny. This is your place of blessing. It comes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob down unto all of, the, of this generation. The wilderness wanderings are over. You've been purged nationally of your rebellion, your murmuring, and your sin. Go over and take the land. There's going to be giants to fight. There's going to be walls to topple. But I want you to know, children of Israel, I want you to know that the land is yours and God delights to bless you in it. And if you will obey him, he will not bless you because you're obedient. You see, that's bartering with God, and we don't have anything to offer. He will bless you through your obedience. This is what people are not understanding. God has laws that are in place in the kingdom. They're universal laws. And he pours out his blessing in specific means and specific ways, specific places. And it is always going to fall. It may encounter other things, but it will always fall in the place where obedience is. And so it's not that we're obedient. We say, God, now you owe me. It is this, that when, if God is blessing and all of his blessing is coming down in this area of obedience, if we disobey, friends, he's not taking something away from us. We're just not in the place where the blessing is. But if we will obey, we step into the place where the blessing is falling. He's not blessing us because of our obedience. He's blessing through our obedience. Our obedience positions us to encounter the blessings of God. And if we choose to disobey, it's not that God is cursing us. It's not that God is, is, is punishing us. Now, I'm not saying that there's not discipline. There is chastisement for those that are enter into and refuse to repent of perpetual sin. That is a different subject and a different message. But what I'm saying is this. The whole earth is cursed. It's under a curse. The depravity of man is everywhere. You still have a flesh imprint on you. Yes, you're reborn. You have a new nature. The old man is dead. The new man has raised up, been raised up. But the spirit and the flesh still war against each other. That's going to happen until you get a glorified body where there is no more flesh imprint on you anymore. But friends, listen. When we step away from obedience, we step into the arena where the curse is already operative. And so whereas in the place of obedience, the downpour upon us is the blessing and the favor and the goodness of God. Why? Because we're aligned with his heart. We have aligned ourselves with who he says he is. And when we choose to disobey in those moments, all we're doing is we're stepping outside of that arena when we come out from under the place of favor and blessing and all of the goodness of God. What are we then experiencing? We're experiencing everything else. And it's not good. And so when people that are in the world, in your family, 
in your workplace, in your schools. They, there is pleasure for them in sin for a season. But one of the things that they cannot argue with is when you are standing in the place of joyful obedience unto God and you walk with peace and you walk with joy and you walk with generosity and you, you emit love out of your spiritual pores and they look at that and they say, what is that? And there is something inside of those that are going to be heirs of salvation. There is something inside of them they say, I want me whatever that is. And where does it come? It comes through you as you are in the place of obedience unto the Lord. Does that help at all? Because you know what happens, man? We've been so inundated with performance orientation and behavioral modification that we just think, okay, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a barter. It's like a trade. I obey, God's good to me. I disobey, and God's bad to me. And that's not true, let me tell you. Even when you disobey, he's still being good to you. I mean... I've had people tell me, man, that's, it's just not fair. You know, the way God's got things set up, it's not fair. And I always tell them, I try to do it with a smile. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. The last thing you want God to be is fair. That is, no, 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 you do not want to go there because if God is fair, then every sinner, every single person that has fallen short of his glory ends up in eternal condemnation. That's what's fair. So let's not ask God to be fair. Let's ask God to continue to be merciful and compassionate and let's trust his wisdom. And friends, you're going to experience so much more of his goodness when your heart is to love him. And when you love him, you'll trust him. You know, the lie of Satan is if you obey God, you're going to miss out on a lot of great stuff. And you're going to be boring. And you're going to be, and some of you are old enough to remember the church lady from Saturday Night Live in the 80s, Dana Carvey's. Wasn't that special? You remember her? Him? Whatever. Yeah, and, and the caricature of Christians as these smarmy, pathetic, little ignorant, you know, creatures and, and that's kind of the lie that the, the culture and Satan fosters. And I, I just want to tell you something. Obedience is, is such a delight when you are convinced that you're not missing anything by obeying God. This is tough, man. I, I get it. I know. And you're like, Jeff, y'all said y'all had fun in the morning services. What, what's up, man? Come on. Hey, listen, sometimes we just need to be instructed. So um, let, me, let me give you a few more things, okay? And I'll wrap it up. God wants you to live the abundant life. He wants you to operate in joy. Joy is evidence of an abundant life. Peace is evidence of abundant life. Love is the abundance, uh, excuse me, the evidence of an abundant life. And so is self-control. All of these are fruit of the Spirit. And the enemy does not want you to do that. So 24-7, while we're praying and fasting and, and worshiping and working and doing a life 24-7, the enemy is trying to seduce you. And he knows you. God help me, I'm, I'm trying so hard to stay in one track. I want to tell on the devil for a second. He's been watching humanity since the Garden of Eden. As long as humans have been on earth, Satan and his demons have been observing human nature. And there are enough demons, a third of the angels, not specifically numbered, but a third of the angels rebelled with Satan and they became fallen angels and we call them demons. And do you know what? They never take a day off. And I don't know if you can receive this or not, but I'm going to make you a promise. They are active against you. They are working, strategizing, actively against you and so they want to seduce you out of the place of blessing because obedience brings that nature that that quality to the christian life that is inviting to other people and obedience is a gateway to bringing god great glory and there's nothing that satan and the demons hate worse than for god to be glorified because Satan wanted all that glory for himself and since he can't have it he doesn't want God to get it either and so what does he do he fights you because he doesn't want you to be a glory bearer he doesn't want you to be an emblem that reveals the glory of God in your generation so he wants to seduce you incrementally he wants to he'll he take his time with you he'll take his time and he'll just bring you a little bit out at a time until you're no longer in the arena of that downpour of where God blesses and so let's just talk about very quickly in verses 17 and 18 how success is slayed. 
and we get a warning about our hearts, and this is all of us. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, that's where you are in trouble. When your heart gets hard and you decide, I'm not listening to this stuff anymore. When, when the revelation of God, when the word of God, when the, the spirit of God and the voice of God become a grievance to you, when you get in that bad place, when you get isolated, by the way, this is one of the reasons why we're, we're called to meet together regularly, not because it, it meets a legalistic checklist, but because we are to exhort and provoke one another unto love and good works. And you can't do that isolated. And so the devil likes to get you isolated. He wants you to preach all the negative junk to yourself. And what happens over time is your heart can actually turn away. By the way, our churches are filled with people whose bodies are in church, but their heart's not there. Their, their bodies are in the kingdom, but their desires aren't there. Their, their lips speak all sorts of kingdom rhetoric, but their heart is mute. And Moses warned the people of Israel, hey, when you're in the place of blessing, don't let your heart turn away. Not even a quarter inch, not even a minute. And don't refuse to listen. Don't refuse to hear. And then there's a warning, a warning about our walk. When your heart turns away and you will not hear, you will be drawn away to worship other gods. Now, I know you don't have a totem pole in your house and you don't have you know, little handcrafted you know, statues and stuff that you bow down to. But, but you're living in a polytheistic culture. That just simply means a culture with lots of gods. And I can name them all, but all you got to do is go home and turn on the TV and watch the commercials. There's your gods. That's the nature of the, the culture. Everything they're trying to tell us we can't live without. Everything that provokes our longings. Everything that stirs us to be dissatisfied with who we are and what we have. And these false gods of our culture say, you need me, you need me, you need me. And so people bend over backwards and they literally undermine their livelihoods in order to get gods that can't satisfy their souls. And so Moses was warning the children of Israel, there's a lot of pagan gods in that land, but you have one God. Yahweh is your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is your God. Don't be drawn away after other gods. And, and, and again, I just, I, I feel like I'm supposed to just warn us for a moment on this. Watch your walk. Watch your walk. Nobody's immune from this. 45 seconds outside of being yoked up with the Holy Spirit and fellowship, and you'll do things you will be embarrassed and scandalized by. That's all it takes. We don't put any confidence in our flesh, but when you walk with the Lord, none of these things have any kind of authority in your life. But we are warned about it, and because we're warned about it, we need to think on it. Then verse 18, this is the hardest thing that Moses says in this passage. He says, I declare to you today that you'll perish if you're drawn away to worship other gods, if your heart turns away, if you refuse to hear, if you serve other gods, you will surely perish. You'll not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. So God's called us to this place of bountifulness and abundance, but we don't obey just to get there. We obey because we fall in love with him and we trust him. And then when we're in the place of blessing, when we're in that promised land, that moment of destiny, that defined place that God has for you, listen, God has an abundant place for every single one of us in this room. He actually has ordained and available a, a, a place in life, a station in life, where you and him will enjoy to the max who he is and who he is making you to be. And that thing is not going to be just handed to you glibly and arbitrarily. You have to fight for it. You have to press in. You have to deny your flesh. You have to say yes to the Spirit. You have to cordon off anything that will strip your mind and your focus away from this call of God in your life to enter into the place of abundance. And friends, it is that radical. I know it's Sunday night, and I know probably your flesh is not in the mood to hear this, but believe me, as I'm warning, I'm also exhorting, I'm also speaking to those that are saying, I hear the warning, but I still want it. I still want the Lord's best. I know it's possible to fail. I know I might risk my heart turning away, but I'm not going to quit. I'm pressing in. Lord, I want to press in to the fullness of the destiny and the inheritance that you have for me. God, help my heart remain true. And he says, 
that there were going to be a lot of people in Israel, and it came to pass, by the way, if you know Israel, Israel's history in the Old Testament, that they got into the, the, the promised land and that God gave them victory after victory after victory and gave them glory as a nation and, and just tremendous fame and glory and wealth and dominance and riches and you see it peaking at King David and King Solomon but then Solomon Solomon why'd you do it man he started marrying these women from other lands and they brought their gods with them and Israel was never the same why what happened a little tick of the heart away from God and Solomon who had been given so much wisdom did not guard it He squandered it because of his sexual appetite. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. He says this, basically he says, I had all the women I could have had and I had all the wine that I could have had and I was miserable. And yet it was too late because those gods entered into Israel and they were the downfall of that nation. Those things are written for our example. Some of you are in that place of bounty and blessing. Some of you are just, you're you're standing so strong. You're being so faithful. You're paying the price. And at times you're in your secret moments, you wonder, God, is this really meaning anything to you? And I want to tell you, yes, absolutely it is. Don't let your heart be turned away. Not every day is a day of breakthrough, but every day leads to breakthrough if we endure and we do not quit. Worship team, I'm going to ask you to come on up as I finish this last point here. The choice ultimately is ours. In verse 19, he tells them to choose. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. And he says, therefore, I want you to choose life. Do you feel the empowerment on that? It is not God's responsibility to make these decisions for us. You have to hear me on that. You have to hear me. Don't ask God to do this for you. Don't. He's telling you, you choose. I've set you up for success. I've got everything you need. I will do it with you, I'll do it in you, I'll do it for you, I'll do it through you. You and I together, we can do this. That was earlier in the chapter, in verse number 11, I think. Moses said, you can do this. And yet what we do is we passively wait on God to do it for us. We have become the Xbox generation. Just life goes on while we're thumbing our lives away. Just sitting there. New Madden coming out, what's going on? I don't own an Xbox, I don't know all the new games, but we, we just, that's the, even if you don't play video games, that's the culture. The culture in the church is, yeah, well, I'm sure if God wants it to happen, he'll take care of it. My friends, do we not realize that so much about the bountiful life rests not only on God and his provision, but he's already set it up. He's asking you, what do you want? What do you really, really want? And so Moses says, I, I, I've called heaven and earth a witness against you today. I've said it before you. Moses, as the spokesperson, has done everything he's going to do. He tells them to choose. He tells them to devote themselves. In verse 20, he says, you've got to be loving the Lord your God. He tells them to trust in verse 20. You need to obey him. Obeying is evidence of faith. Where there is no obedience, there really isn't any faith. Because faith is trust. And so our obedience is the fruit of valid faith. Wherever we're disobedient, it's because we're not loving God and we're not trusting God in that moment. It doesn't mean you're not fond of God. But do you remember what he said to Peter? Jesus said to Peter after Peter denied Jesus, the question for, from Jesus to Peter was not, hey, how come you didn't do what I told you to do? The question from Peter to Jesus was, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter had to agonize through that because the Lord kept asking and bringing Peter to this place of confronting the level of his love for Jesus. The, the reason why Peter denied Jesus was not simply that he was afraid. It was that he loved Peter. Peter loved Peter more than Peter loved Jesus. And when we love ourselves more than we love the Lord, we will eventually come to a place where we say no to him and yes to us. And we lose that promised place of inheritance and blessing. And so at the very end, he says this. He says, receive. He says, in verse 20, he says, he is your life, God is your life, and the length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. I just love this about God, and it's available right now. He's still offering. He still offers. He knows our track record. He knows 
where we've been and where we are today. And he's still saying, I would love for you to step and li- step in and live in the place of my downpoured blessing. And he's asking us, do we really want that? Because if you want that, here we go. If you want that, you will be simultaneously living in a state of denying the world and denying yourself and taking up your cross and carrying it daily. And at the same time that you're denying that, you're receiving what he has to say. You're receiving what, we, what he has to offer. And you're saying yes to what he requires. And that our heavenly father brings us to this place where he says, I love you and I love you so much. I'm not going to override your decision you choose choose life choose death choose blessing choose cursing choose me or choose yourself but you choose so ultimately we come to this place where we've got to decide what are we going to choose say jeff i made that choice i got saved a long time ago that's not even what i'm talking about i'm talking about what are you choosing concerning who he is and what he has for you and if you're dissatisfied with where you've been with him then consider what you've heard today Consider what's been set before you today and just ask yourself, is there a depth of obedience, discipline, and and love that I can step in with him that will actually facilitate me experiencing the things that my soul longs for? Or am I going to keep living in and out, up and down, back and forth? Could you stand to your feet tonight? 